for each chapter each chapter is a condition and for each condition there are five components component one is what are the diagnostic symptoms for each condition you learn all the conditions anxiety stress depression ocd bipolar disorder uh, adhd in adult adhd in child adhd in adolescent bipolar disorder personality disorder eating disorders so loneliness hopelessness so most of the okay so most of the conditions you learn and for each condition you learn what is am i forget very good thank you dipti for each condition you learn five components one is what are the diagnostic symptoms number two what are the medicines and side effect if you are reading it first time and you are not from medical background don't read medicine side effect number three how to talk to the client very important in a chamber or online consultation when you are talking to particular conditions client for that particular condition how will you talk to the client and uh, number four what are their questions and how to answer a good counselor how a good counselor answers those question number five what are the tips practical tips you are going to give to the client 20 to 50 tips for each condition so these are lifestyle changes all those all those things and number 6 is a secret uh, what is a one statement you will tell to the client so that client should come back to you next time and intermittently for each chapter there is a story story which you can tell yourself story which you can tell to your children either as a parent or either as a school teacher so you write the feedback of the book whatever you feel the chapters anxiety stress generalized anxiety disorder panic disorder these are all related the most common condition you click on this and the, the most common condition everyone faces is the stress and anxiety right and for stress and anxiety you need to do certain things there are 20 around 20 to 30 tips which are given in the book so if you have stress and anxiety so start with simple breathing exercise right then you can splash your face you can eat something you can walk around the garden you can do exercise these are the short term immediate for long term you will change your diet reduce your gluten reduce your sugar intake reduce lactose reduce salt intake reduce processed food and canned food that really helps you try one experiment everyone next time so next time when you want to eat pizza right so you go to dominos one day and see what is your effect on next day on your emotions are you getting depressed or are you feeling anxious then after a week or few days you go to pizza hut so one day you go dominos one day title part you write some goody goody things which you whatever you want to write like that makes us summarize it you you eat dominos one week second week you eat pizza hut and you will see that one of them is causing you depression and one of them is causing you anxiety so you know which one does not suit you so it clearly means that there is some component in the preparation that is causing you anxiety right now next week you try experimenting with sweets if you are comfortable eating with one sweet you eat the same sweet three three portions and next day or immediately by tonight you see whether you are getting anxious if you are getting anxious then that particular causes you problem third experiment you will do for anxiety and stress and depression is gluten so continuous three days only three days you have to spend without gluten you will eat dosa or some south indian food or you eat only rice or you eat jowar or other things and you see after 3 days is your anxiety and stress reduced if it is happening with you then you know what is the reason of that what is the most common reason of anxiety stress and depression all those married people they are going to say sir husband and wives correct so 90% that is a problem but other than that if you are like married for more than one year you get accustomed to that if you are not get accustomed to that then it is time to change 
the partner and if it is still happening after one year after you have got accustomed then it is time to look for other causes what is other cause that is happening that is causing you anxiety stress and depression so it can be your office it can be your supervisor manager it can be your assistant it can be your colleague office politics it can be your food don't forget the food so there is a video on the channel which talks of nutrition and dietetics for emotional well being you watch that video today everyone gets the link for the channel in that channel you will watch this video so there are two videos on that one is the video there is a concept of toilet water so you watch this video it's really fun filled video you are going to love it so how people are getting exploited for supplements and special food and special diets and all those things you will realize from that and you don't need fancy things to feel good then there is one more video about 10 things a good nutritionist and dietitian does with the client so if you do that uh, your emotional bank balance will increase so if you search the concept of toilet water you will find that video or you can go to the channel and it's a recent video few days back now coming to the difficult conditions if you see a schizophrenia that is very difficult to treat so you don't need to treat as a psychology counselor schizophrenia you leave it for a mental institution to a psychiatrist but as a psychology counselor you need to help relatives of a schizophrenia client the another difficult condition is narcissist personality but problem with both schizophrenia and narcissist personality is that the client will say i am good everyone is psycho and everyone around them they suffer so you need to as a psychology counselor you need to help this people so what are the problem they are going to go they are going to undergo anxiety stress depression if you see eating disorders so various eating disorders bulimia nervosa anorexia all those all the eating disorders they happen around what age group it happens everyone write down around what age group eating disorders will be there binge eating and all those things so binge eating happens because of depression 10 years bulimia nervosa and anorexia nervosa and everything right so what is the cause of that that cause is anxiety again okay someone who has irritability showing irritability continuously what is the cause again anxiety you trace back now come to bipolar disorder Bi what is bipolar disorder there is a phase of psychosis four days then two weeks there is a phase of depression during this psychosis the client behaves hyper and all those things and the relatives they suffer from anxiety stress and depression and during the depression phase of bipolar disorder the client is suffering from depression again depression what is the cause of loneliness a person is in their family and it is surrounded by the family everyone is there everything looks good outwardly or relatives think that the person is good everything is good family is doing good but the person feels lonely why the person feels lonely because of depression someone gives up hope someone doesn't have hope in their career in their exam job any of those things because they feel they feel hopelessness because they feel that their potential is this much and their expectation is very high they have to achieve this much they cannot fulfill there is a gap so they give up okay. so this hopelessness is a mix of anxiety fear of failure and depression so what is the meaning of this right write down everyone what is the meaning of this what we are discussing come to another common condition menopause loneliness anxiety irritability depression mood swings why they are happening anxiety fear of future so what is the meaning of this if you trace all this condition sometimes students say so the symptoms are overlapping for every condition that is correct that is natural sometimes the symptoms appear in you sometimes the same symptom appear in different conditions sometimes some symptom appear in your child symptoms appear in your husband in laws it means 
the most common condition is anxiety stress depression that is a underlying thing what are happening so if you ask a client what is your emotional turbulence the meaning is not what is your psychological condition what is your diagnosis you don't want that word from the client right you want tell me what is happening with you so the client will come and say i am feeling anxious the client will say they are feeling depressed they are having low mood they are eating more they are not feeling confident they don't have self esteem they don't have uh, positive energy all those things so it means you have to treat this uh, under this thing emotional turbulence anxiety stress and depression if you see majority of the book around 100 page to 150 page they focus on these three conditions right because these are the major chunk of your business and you should focus on these clients if you get a difficult client don't focus on the client then you focus on the relatives of the client because relatives of the client are the sufferers now the client schizophrenic client narcissist client they don't need help because they think they are they are good the relatives think that there is something wrong and sometimes relatives start feeling that they are something problem they have psychological condition if you see in marriage counseling if you get a couple one uh, spouse will say that they themselves blame them for the relationship failure but when you take more history you do relationship test you talk to them more you will find oh my god the other spouse has narcissist personality they have manipulated the other spouse the first spouse so much that first ta spouse starts feeling they are the problem in the relationship but actual problem is this you understand so this anxiety stress depression these are the, your major chunk of the business major chunk of your psychology counseling clients so you should know this very well what are the symptoms you should know what are the common medicine names and what are the side effects you should know what are their common questions and what are the good answers you should know how to counsel them and what are the tips you should give them everything there is in the book okay now in addition to anxiety stress depression there is another thing relationship issues trust issues and fear fear of unknown some apprehension they are always fearing something and this fear is translated to anxiety the fear is translated to repetitive thoughts you keep on thinking something you keep on thinking something something is going to happen something bad then this this will happen then this will happen this will happen so what happens you have fear this fear leads to anxiety this anxiety leads to multiple stress hormones in your body cortisol adrenaline and everything plus this anxiety and fear it leads to repetitive thoughts this repetitive thoughts and uh, stress hormones they further lead to your stress it has a negative impact on your body it increases your bp increases your heart rate increases your diabetes risk increases risk of cancer right reduces your immunity it lowers your dopamine level you start feeling completely emotionally drained you show it in irritability and everything increase weight everything and this leads to again anxiety now what you need okay once you identify this anxiety stress depression relationship issues trust issues fear what you will do there are two steps now two modes to manage these things right one is you give them tips you give them some solutions some lifestyle changes to manage it immediately short term number 2 you need to take their history and the triggering factors and the emotional trauma what has led to it there was a time when you were feeling good you did not have anxiety stress depression you were very confident you were very aspirational but something happened to you you got betrayed in your life so a friend left you spouse left you you got fired in your job you got embarrassed somewhere <clears throat> you got insulted you had emotional trauma all those things are leading to your permanent symptoms in your present life all this is leading to your emotional turbulence so you need to heal this emotional trauma okay so first you need to find out what is the root cause of emotional trauma then you use to use neuroplasticity techniques <clears throat> 
Now, what is neuroplasticity techniques? Name of the techniques is mentioned in the book. If you want to learn neuroplasticity techniques, you will talk to me. It is taught in the separate program, psychotherapy, which happens on Sunday. So in the neuroplasticity, what happens is, whenever you have a betrayal, give me a second. Huh? Whenever you have betrayal, emotional trauma, insults, embarrassing moment, all those things. So that gets stored in your memory, that gets uh, stored in your brain as images, in the form of images. So you get flashbacks. Memories are not stored as the words. Memories are stored as images. Then second is, the memories are stored as synapses. So there are neurons in the brain. These neurons, they communicate through synapses. And because of this synapses, it defines your reaction. So next time you happen in your same scenario, you are going to react it differently. You were betrayed by someone. Next time you do not trust someone. You were fired from a job. Next time you are afraid to apply for a job. So your synapses, that defines what is your reaction. <laughs> So you need neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity means replacing your images, changing your synapses so that your response gets changed, your habits get changed. You are doing something, there is a trigger factor. This trigger comes, that scenario comes, you are acting in a particular way. You want for a good life, you want to act in a different way. Now this different way can happen when you change this synapses. It happens with neuroplasticity. Synapses. Synapses, you can Google dear. So synapses means it is in the brain, there are neurons, right? Neuron cells. These neurons, they communicate to each other through synapses. Synapses is a junction. So it's an electrochemical junction. One neuron communicates to other neuron through the synapses. Correct. So this rewiring, this neurosynapses, you will learn in psychotherapy program, if you wish to. That you can read in the book also. The basic of it is given. It helps in old memories also. So any of your memories, which is a old memory, it helps to heal that also. Or the fresh memories. Then there are techniques for increasing emotional bank balance. You will learn that. By therapies, bad memories can be removed by good memories. Correct. So it can be replaced also. It's not mentioned. This program is not mentioned on the website. It's mentioned in the book and you can talk to me separately if you wish. Now, should we start with the game? I will ask the scenarios and you will tell the diagnosis. Good idea. Okay. Parents come to you. Uh, they bring a five-year-old child. And they say that uh, this child does not sit in the class. And uh, child is very active, hyperactive or something. And... The child is hyperactive in everything. Child is very talkative. There is a half question asked in the class. The child answers it first. And uh, child is very playful, very high energetic. So what is your diagnosis? The age of the child is five years. Okay, those who are written ADSD, they need their treatment actually for ADSD. Giving rapid answer is also ADHD actually. And those who are written mania, oh my God, what to do? Yeah, so Sujitra is saying, what is a complaint? Looks like a normal child. Okay, that's good answer actually. Child is a child. Child is five years. Absolutely okay. 
So think first common things. It can be a normal behavior. It can be active kid. Very good. It can be a child is a child. There is no problem. It's absolutely okay. Child is more energetic. <laughs> it's good. So utilize this energy for studies. Utilize this energy for sports. Utilize this energy for creativity. Don't label the child <laughs> ADSD. Just because you are saying the child is hyperactive. You saw, heard that word hyperactive and suddenly ADSD. You know the problem with this label is that that is label is going to stay for lifetime. And parents are going to behave that this is a special child outcast. And the child will think that, okay, whatever I do stupid things, it is accepted because I have ADSD. The child will beat other children. The child will bully other children. Child will break the toys. Child will behave abnormally and will blame it on ADSD. So you are giving escape mechanism. Don't do that. Okay. All those people, those who wrote ADSD before the completion of question, actually your diagnosis is ADSD in adults. So you should read the chapter in the book, ADHD in adults, and you should do your treatment as per that. Okay. Don't worry, but don't take medicines. Okay. And don't write on your head, you are ADSD. You write that you are ADSD. I will give you another case. There are two children. They come to you. You are a school teacher or you are a counselor, school counselor. You visit a school and you are talking to a group of children. There is a one uh, boy who is like moving like me, you know, moving and animated, talking, moving and doing things, right? And rocking the chair, not sitting quietly. Both are now seven to eight years Second standard, third standard. And uh, you see one girl who is sitting quietly. Okay. Now you take the interview. You ask, hey, how many of you like playing? So everyone says, yeah, I like playing. So then you ask, how many of you like studying? Some people raise the hand. So this boy is not raising the hand. But the girl is raising the hand who seems to be reserved. Then you say, how many of you do not have friends? So the girl raises the hand. She does not have friend. How many of you have frequent fights, frequent quarrels during play? No one raises the hand because the girl doesn't want. So teacher says, yeah, actually it happens with her. Then you ask, uh, <clears throat> how is your study? The girl says it's okay. The study is affected. And the boy says, my study is good. The boy is outwardly hyperactive, rocking in the chair, not sitting quietly, talking very, very. The girl is reserved and the girl has low scoring and girl has fights during plays. The girl doesn't have friends. Who has ADSD and who has autism? Good. I like Sakshi. How you think? Very good. I like Kankana. Both are different in nature. Very good. Just like girl has autism, okay. Only this much only you diagnose autism. I, if I would have said who has schizophrenia, then you would have said at least one person should have schizophrenia. Uh, right? So then you say the teacher has schizophrenia, right? Someone must have. The boy is boy, energetic boy. Has friends playing without quarrel or minimum quarrels, acceptable quarrels is good in scoring. The boy is hyperactive. It doesn't mean ADSD. The girl, outwardly, she is reserved. There are two, three pinpoints. One is she does fights frequently, more than others. <coughs> she is not able to make friends. Now, that doesn't make autism. That is not a diagnosis of autism. You have to find more things in autism. 
<laughs> there is going to be some developmental delay. There is going to be some social behavioral problem, some social engagement problem. Then you call it autism. If somebody is not meeting, matching the eyes, someone doesn't reflect, takes time for talking. There are many things you are going to do. Autism is a very serious label. If you label a child very easily like autism, that is a crime. Don't do that because it stays for a lifetime. It's very difficult to call it. ADSD, if you ask this girl more questions, right? If you find talk to the parents of the girl, probably you will find that this girl changes the toys frequently. This girl changes the games frequently. Playing one thing, then jumps to other. Doing some craft activity, jumps to other. Studying one subject, jumps to other. So there is a good likelihood that this girl may have ADSD. I like the way Kankana and other people, one more, you have said, uh, Shreya or Shruti, that the girl may be bullied also. There may be something wrong also. Right? Good possibility. Good. You are thinking from a holistic approach. Don't come to the diagnosis. Always come to differential diagnosis. Just a second. So the differential diagnosis can be one diagnosis, second diagnosis. It can be this. It can be a normal child. It can be bullied child at school. It can be oppressed child at home. It can be some other problem. It can be some worm infestation. It can be child with a low mood. It can be early puberty. Any of these things. It can be child with less confidence because of parents or other reason. It can be ADSD. It can be autism. But for autism, you need to do something more to identify that. So don't label the child very easily. And it can be completely normal introvert, shy girl, right? Who are in studies? Correct, Arpita. Very good. Very good. Uma has given a very good example and very in-depth insight. So girl craves attention, but she is afraid of socializing. So to satisfy her attention, she fights with others. Itself a possibility. Correct. Anything can be there. So have always a holistic approach. Don't go for diagnosis. Never label a child autism. Sometimes you will find that a mother will come and she will say, you know, my child has been diagnosed ADHD, depression, and this, this is anxiety. Okay. <laughs> Probably someone who diagnosed needs a treatment. Or the mother needs the treatment. So mother has gone to the Google and diagnosed the child that this is a problem. So mother is attention seeking. It happens. So be careful with that. Correct. There may be nature only. Now for autism, if you read the chapter on autism, so there is a statement a kid who can float. Don't teach this kid how to run. Teach this kid how to fly. So the concept I will tell you. So you have seen yourself as a child. You have seen other children that everyone first starts crawling. Then they walk and then they run. Sometimes you have the same expectation from autism and ADHD child. This autism and ADHD child, they do not know how to walk. They know how to float. So you test them, teach them how to fly. Don't tell them how to run. Because the game is different for them. They have a different skill set. Someone who is autistic may be good in some other skill. So you identify what is the skill set of your child and help that child grow in that skill. It's not necessary that you need to have a good IQ or high IQ. Sometimes more efforts, discipline is also important or it is sufficient to score good marks in your entrance and get good uh, seat. 
sometimes an autistic child will have other potential so you need to identify that and help that kid so autistic child knows how to float teach them how to fly now their float this skill what is that skill you need to identify yeah. so don't expect your child if someone is autistic don't expect them to run Now, when you want to diagnose someone with autism, you need to take care of three developmental factors. So one is psychological growth, second is neurological growth, and third is physical growth. In autism, this is for all children. In autism, you take for social interaction. Okay. So if you talk to the child, whether the child is responding back, whether the child is able to complete the sentences as per the age or the child answers in single words or single phrase. How's their motor skills? Eye contact, correct. How's their motor skills? That defines their uh, neurological growth. How's their behavior with the team, other people? That defines their social and psychological growth. Now, this autism is not disease. Don't treat it like, oh my God, someone has autism, they are going to die. This autistic child, they will become adult. And there is a plan for them. You have to help these kids. You have to help these parents. So there are two aspects. <coughs> Number one, stop treating them like, hey, this is an autistic child. If at home you label this child, this child will behave differently. This child will behave erratic. This child will do some antisocial behavior and blame it on autism. Right? They, because there is an escape mechanism. That label is escape. Number two, that you need to assimilate this child into society. So you need to tell the parents that there are these are the 31 things out of these things, which are the things you select. So you have a group get together for friends with your child, either in your apartment or school uh, children. You invite for the party and educate these children how to assimilate this child. So there are 31 things a parent will tell to the friends of autistic child. So these 31 things are mentioned. What is the page number of this? Someone can you help me? 30 things. 30 ways. What is the page number? Depending on which edition book you are issued, 191, 193, 175. Okay, so there are different editions you are issued. So the page number, this page, 30 ways. <laughs> the edition which I have, it has 191. So the 30 ways you will tell to the parent, train the parent. This parent will educate other children so that this child is assimilated with them. It is very important. You don't want your child to be called autistic. You don't want you to call your child autistic. You don't want this label because the child will not be able to grow. The child will also ha always have anti-social behavior and the child will blame the failure, blame the anti-social behavior on one label, autism. You don't want that. Okay. And if you call your child autistic, other children will find it difficult to make friends. The parents of other children will say that, hey, this is psycho child. Huh? You stay away from that. The other parents, they are not going to call your child autistic. They are going to call your child psycho. This boy is psycho. Stay away from this boy. Very harmful. Yeah. Schooling. Trupti, very good question. Now in the school, if a teacher diagnoses your child, so you have to confront the teacher, tell me which test you are using. What is the statistical significance of this test? What is the alpha value and what is the beta value? How confirmed is your test that you say that this test diagnoses autism and you have been able to diagnose? Show me what is your qualification that you call my child autistic. 
you have to make sure <coughs> no one levels your child. Now imagine a scenario. Your child scores less in the exam and teacher calls dumb, writes on the book of the child, your child is dumb child. Will you like that? So that is an abuse. That is an abusive word. If you don't like that, how you are accepting someone calling your child autistic? Never accept that. You have to fight it. Right? So, madam, whatever is your qualification, you don't have authority to call the child autistic. Tell me the test you are used. If you are read 10 symptoms from a book and four symptoms you find in the child and you call autism. Today, after discussing with you, I have found three symptoms of schizophrenia in you, ma'am. Shall I call you schizophrenia patient? I can give you a certificate right now. Yeah, confront to that. Special educator does not have legal authority to call a child autism. Tell her that according to which law, who is authorizing you to diagnose the child? Bring that certificate to me. You can always challenge this. You can ask her which is the test you are used. Show me the results of the test. I want the analysis of the test. Right? You can talk to the principal. You can talk to your lawyer. Now, there are some scenarios. The school will use a play game. So the child is not good in one subject. So school doesn't want this child to go into 8th standard, 9th standard, 10th standard because that will affect the overall percentage of the high scorers in the school. So they, they will accept what they will do. They will tell you that your child has this learning disability. So ask what is the, sub, what is the test you have used to call the child as learning disability in this particular subject. If the child is weak, what do you think? What can be the reasons? Everyone write down. What can be the reason that the child is weak in particular subject? Lack of interest, very common. Dislike the teacher. Teacher is not good. Teacher has schizophrenia or hopeless teacher. Teacher is not teaching good. Concept not clear, basics not clear, missed some classes. Right? Too much pressure, aptitude not there. The child doesn't like this. But that doesn't mean fear of learning. All those pressure, expectations, all those things. The, or efforts not put. Simple is efforts not put by the child or the parents. Needs more help. Does not like the school. <laughs> Does not like the teacher. Does not like teaching method. So learning disability should be the last. Right? So don't label a child that the child has learning disability before the child is scoring less. Sometimes some parents come to us and they say, sir, can you give the certificate of learning disability for this subject? So I say them very frankly, I do not have a test which is scientifically proven, which is statistically significant to prove that your child has learning disability in a particular subject. So the parents argue that our school teacher or school special educator has done the diagnosis. I always ask them politely, please bring me the statistical test which they have used and the analysis of that test. Just because your child has scored less marks, don't fall for this learning disability. Because maybe your child can with more help, okay, special, some edu some tuition or your special attention at home, extra studies at home, child can grow in this subject. <laughs> child needs extra focus. If the child can become engineer, child can become superstar, child can, child can become MBA, CA, that dream will be gone if you accept this learning disability. Right? Don't fall for this diagnosis. This is not a diagnosis. This is a man-made thing to remove your child from that. Okay? So there is nothing called learning disability. There is a thing called teaching disability. So the teacher is not good. Teacher cannot teach, right? So you give the diagnosis on the paper to the teacher, write the name of the teacher. Then you draw a triangle and give a paper to the teacher from today onwards, your diagnosis is teaching disability for this subject. Okay, teacher, you resign from the job. Then I change the class uh, subject for my child. 
Okay. Just a second. Any question? Anyone has undergone? Okay, how many of you as a parent has undergone with the diagnosis? Either the school played this game or teacher played this game or special educator was dumb enough to diagnose your child. Autism, learning disability, ADSD, depression. Yeah. So if you are gone, you can write what was the diagnosis someone has given. What was the diagnosis? So you ask them, what is the test they have used? What is the alpha value of the test? What is the beta value of the test? And what is the uh, interpretation of that test, analysis of the test? I want that questionnaire. <coughs> then you also take, give the test uh, result verbal diagnosis on the, this thing, right? So there are two students. I will tell you one interesting story. Okay, focus now, stop writing. Yeah, you are a very sincere student and you are having a lot of cold in your area. Okay, good, you are covered up completely. So there are two students, both have ADSD, okay? One parents are over cautious. They are like, oh my God, my child has ADSD and they treat it like a disease. They go from one counselor to other, jump, keep jumping. There is no treatment for ADSD. They sometimes start the medicine, they create a depression to the child or because of the label of ADSD, the child always has anxiety, child is behaving erratic, antisocial and blaming it on ADSD. Okay. The child does not grow. There is another child has ADSD, does not know the diagnosis. The parents also does not know the, do not know the diagnosis. The teachers also do not know the diagnosis. The teachers cry. They come to school. So every year one teacher will cry. Okay, I cannot teach this class. There is a one student who is running in the class. And if I am uh, explaining a poem, this child is enacting the poem. Seriously, what is this? Yeah, and it continued to happen from third standard, fourth standard, fifth standard, 11th, 12th, MBBS, PG. Every year there was one teacher who used to cry, literally cry and leave the class. Okay, and this student, did not know there is something called ADSD. The parents did not know there is something called ADSD. The uh, teachers did not know there is something called ADSD, right? What do you think which child will grow in life? Yeah, if you treat ADSD or if you ignore ADSD, which child will grow? Yeah, so ignorance is bliss. So why don't you ignore it? Yeah, so <coughs> naughty child, Mischievous child, no problem. You call anything, right? So this child was crazy. So as the child got matured and when the teachers used to go out of the class crying, so the child used to stay. Mom, at least take the attendance before you go. And then all other girls are like, hey, what are you saying, stupid? She is crying because of you and you are saying, ma'am, take the attendance? What stupid? And then girls used to go and apologize to, apologize to the teacher and say, ma'am, please, sorry that he is a psycho only. He doesn't know. He has ADSD. Ma'am, please come to the class. And then next time the ma'am comes to the class and um, then exam comes. Okay. And after the exam, uh, ma'am is very sincere, actually, though she has cried. Then she sees that, oh, how is this possible? This mischievous, this psycho, this ADSD boy, he's the topper in the class. How is this possible? Yeah. So because the topper, because he does not know that he has ADSD. Yeah. So it's, bad, it's better to have that. And that child was me actually. Yeah. So when you have ADSD, the body, there are three problems, okay? One is you cannot pay attention to one thing. So you are doing multitasking. And ADHD comes with its anxiety and depression phase. So you need to do two things. Number one, you need to stop multitasking. <laughs> so you need to do multitasking. Sorry. <laughs> I was checking whether you are paying attention. So that is also ADHD. Yeah? 
So you need to stop doing multitasking, ADHD people. And second is, you need to manage your anxiety, stress, and depression that comes with ADHD. Okay. If you are able to do these things, then you can overcome the problems. So the ADHD is not a disease. You cannot out or uh, read it, get rid of it. You need to learn to leave it. So the problem is someone has ADHD, their outcome, their functional role in the society, a student's functional role is to study and score good marks, to secure good rank in the good college, right? Then once you start earning, important is to earn. When you are doing a job, it is important to stay in one job, not leave that job because you have ADHD. So, so someone who has ADHD, they have dysfunction. So if you are able to manage your dysfunction, you can lead good life. You can succeed. So to succeed, to overcome the ADSD, you need to do two things. One is you learn certain techniques to increase your emotional bank balance, learn certain techniques to reduce your anxiety, stress and depression. And do less. You avoid multitasking. So I'm forcing my mind to not touch my mobile and not read the book while talking and not drink the coffee while talking. So this is multitasking. I will give another example. We come to the another case study. How many of you feel that you have ADSD? After you have read the book, after reading the book, you feel that you have ADSD. It's okay. You can self-label yourself. Don't worry. Or you feel your child has ADSD. Some traits are there, okay? Not ADSD, but OCD, yeah. Yeah, actually husbands, they always have narcissist and schizophrenia. They don't have good diagnosis like ADSD, yeah. So depression, ADSD, OCD, they are in you. Schizophrenia, narcissist personality, bipolar, maniac, they happen on poor husbands. Maybe borderline. It's nothing wrong. If you have ADSD, it's okay, absolutely okay. Okay, you can still survive. Now I will ask another question. There is a man around. Hey, why man only is a victim? Why not woman? Huh. There is a woman this time. And 35 years of age. She comes to you for a job. And you see in her resume, six months, eight months, four months. And between these two jobs, always have a break. Again, six months, one year, two year. Leaving the job before getting another job. That is what stupid are you. And not having an income during this phase. Then taking time to find another job, failing multiple interviews. Then finding another job thinking that this is a calling, okay? You ask why there is so much gap, they will always give reason. Someone died, that is a common reason. Okay. Then they will like, uh, I did not like that company. Uh -huh. That company did not suit me, I did not suit them. I did not like the manager, I did not like the culture, all those stupid excuses they will give, okay? Actually the problem is them, yeah, family problems. Then health problem, you ask, hey, what was the health diagnosis? So I'm like, hey, give me that certificate, what was your health diagnosis? There was one girl <coughs> who said father was ill. I said, okay, give me that paper which shows your father was ill. I will hire you right now. Then she called one friend. She went outside. She called one friend and she brought one MRI report. I was like, yeah, she is truthful. Yeah. And by mistake, I read the name on this MRI report. And that surname was different than this girl here. Yeah. yeah. And then I asked, uh, are you married? She said, no. What is your father's name? Uh, she saw WhatsApp. Okay. <laughs> and she read her father's name from the report. I said, both you have surname difference. She gave some story. She had a backstory for that also. Very intelligent. That was very intelligent girl. She had a backstory for why her father has a different surname. So I was really impressed with that. And then I did the diagnosis. She has autism. Okay. <clears throat> so now, someone who has this condition, what do you think is a diagnosis? 
now it can be bipolar disorder because when they have manic episode they take impulsive judge, impulsive decisions number one so don't jump for the diagnosis always go for differential diagnosis okay so one can be bipolar disorder second can be adhd third can be autism fourth can be antisocial behavior psychopaths they do something bad in every company with everyone they go then they are fired or they leave the job when they are caught correct now start from uh, this bipolar disorder right so you have to think of differential diagnosis and then start from each diagnosis bipolar disorder only this thing does not prove you ask more history do you have binge shopping episodes you ask the relatives does this person take a risk how's the behavior how's your mood tell me about your month so a bipolar disorder will always say four month four days <coughs> hyperactive impulsive risk taker and two weeks depression or they will say two weeks depression four five days or one week good feeling so you know what is a diagnosis then second comes adhd so you can ask them more history you read from this adhd chapter what are the other things they cannot focus they are hyperactive they are jumping from one activity to another they have their bouts of anxiety stress and depression then autism in autism you will look for neurological growth psychological growth social growth and physical growth autism spectrum disorder majorly relies on social abnormality social behavior unable to make friends fighting at the workplace fighting during games giving answers in the one word not sticking to the commitment changing jobs if you see most of the people those who have intermittent job histories they are switching jobs they are leaving the job without they get second job most likely diagnosis will be autism then followed by psychopaths right anti social behavior everywhere they go they do some anti social behavior they betray people they fight they steal they do something wrong non compliance and they get fired right <laughs> they think they are not born to work delirium of grandiosity so delirium is one of the feature of what is the diagnosis if you are delirium hallucination psychosis what does it look for what are you looking for what is your diagnosis most likely schizophrenia there is one question you are going to ask for a schizophrenia patient how do you diagnose so you ask the relatives is this person normal or abnormal the relatives will say completely hopeless abnormal gone case mad psycho schizophrenic okay you ask the client you ask the patient hey how are you what do you think about yourself so the client will say i am good everyone else is psycho so that is a diagnosis of schizophrenia schizophrenia people they feel that they are normal so they deny if you get a client someone says that i have these symptoms i do these things so the diagnosis is cannot be schizophrenia but someone says that i am normal and they have this delirium hallucination <coughs> psychotic episodes more likely is schizophrenia okay you read the book more correct question please ask some questions so are you understanding how you are approaching right so don't read the chapter okay and apply as soon as you read adhd you say that you have adhd a hey, wrong diagnosis here okay as soon as you read schizophrenia you say husband has schizophrenia a hey, wrong diagnosis okay as soon as you read narcissist personality you call your one of your relative narcissist person right don't do that 
So you have to think of differential diagnosis. Okay, always have four or five diagnosis for the condition. Then rule out why not this? Why not this? You like this? If you like differential diagnosis approach, Suchitra has asked a very difficult question. Can a person with bipolar disorder during a maniac episode, she has written in the bracket, so be very narcissist and grandiose and suffer from psychosis and imagine things, means hallucinations, which are closer to schizophrenia. Now, two th this is can overlap. A person can have schizophrenia. Person can have bipolar disorder also. Saranya has asked the most difficult question. How to reduce uh, mobile addiction in children? Okay. It's like what question you are asking, right? So very difficult. <laughs> For mobile addiction, first we need to reduce our own mobile addiction. Number two, you give them dedicated one mobile. In that mobile, you tell them the rules. No Facebook, no Instagram, no TikTok, TikTok, nothing. You can watch from this time to this time. And take YouTube premium subscription. Why? When you take YouTube premium subscription, the advertising is gone. When there is advertising, the child may click on the link and go to new pages, new things, new games, new links might get addicted to porn and anime and all those things. You don't want that, right? So always remember YouTube premium is a very good subscription and there is a family plan. Dedicated mobile with the child is always a good idea, but you have to monitor this mobile. So how do you monitor? You can watch the history. You can watch the, whenever the child is watching the YouTube, you can watch with the child. So that the algorithm is showing what the child is watching yesterday or the last one month. If some objection video comes here, so you can tell the child, block this channel, not good for you. You know what is going on. Yeah. The next uh, easy, uh, I mean, the another part to reduce mobile addiction is involve the child for cooking, helping you in cooking. Very good activity. It helps for bonding. Do some craft exercise. Help the child study. <coughs> Take up some exam. Olympiad exam, Abacus, Vedic Maths. And help them learn that. You also learn something. You know, when you learn Vedic Maths, Abacus, it decreases your... Uh, cognitive decline. It increases your blood flow. Sometimes some mothers are like that while doing cook while cooking also they are watching the mobile and they tell the child, "Hey, stop watching the mobile." So the child replies back. Just a second. Yeah. Give house course chores. Cooking is a good activity. Craft is a good activity. Learning a new activity is a good activity. So the question should be nowadays. So how to prevent porn addiction for the child? Especially if child is 12 years and about 10 years and above. You know, the problem, what is happening is in YouTube or Instagram, anywhere, there is an algorithm. This algorithm will identify what is the age of the child watching the uh, video. This algorithm will identify which child is predisposed for this addiction. If your child is watching, watching particular set of videos, your child is less likely to get addicted. If your child is watching particular set of videos, your child is more likely to get addicted to porn.
For that, do not allow Instagram on your mobile. Do not allow Facebook. You can have YouTube because YouTube, there is multiple safety features, parental controls. Plus, if you take YouTube premium, the external links are blocked, right? It's YouTube now. That's also good. Correct, Kirti. Right. Now, Sojan has asked a very relevant question. I will take this. Can we allocate the child their own room? You know, there are benefits for that. There are scientific studies. So what they did, everyone pay attention, stop writing. They took two set of kids. One set of kids who used to sleep with their parents till 12 years, 15 years, 16 years. Either in the same room or on the same bed. There is a set of children who are sleeping in the different room. Okay, from early age. So what they found, there is a statistical significant difference. If the child starts sleeping in a separate room as early possible, the child will grow independent. The child will be more fearless. The child will have more confidence. Okay. There is a statistical significant test. So if you are, if you compare the child who is sleeping with the parents up to eight years of age, child who is sleeping with the parents up to 12 years of age, you will find this child grows better than this 12 years child. Okay. There is another concept. Now, if the child is feeling scared, very good question, Kankana. You need to resolve that why the child is scared. Sometimes parents threaten the child. Hey, if you don't listen to me, if you don't do this, this ghost will come and take you. There is the word fear is starting. Okay. Hey, this, uh, someone will come and take you. Someone will harm you. So this is where the fear is starting. Sometimes you uh, allow other, uh, some relative to tell your child something which scares. Okay. We have a very clear rule at our home. No scary tactics. Okay. If the child does not listen to you, it's okay. But you will not scare the child. If you don't listen to me, this will happen. No. Tell the truth. Why you should listen to me? You convince the child. You watch one video. There is a video of uh, Pinky Promise and uh, Child Counseling where my daughter and me both are in the video. There is a video on the channel. You will find that so, anything, if I want her to do or not to do, I will explain her the rationale. I will never tell her, hey, you do this. And no scary things, no threatening, no tactics. <laughs> Subira. Now, there is another concept. There is one more experiment. Now, among the child, children who have good in maths, who are average in maths, the child may be average in maths, but with studies, with tuition, with more interest, with more focus, with more effort, they can grow into good in maths. Those who are good in maths, why you need to be good in maths? Because you learn to solve the problem. When you grow as an adult, you learn to solve the problem of your life. When you are good in maths, when you are good in algebra, geometry, you learn to approach the problem from a different angle. In this way, this theory will work, this theorem will work. No, I have to apply this theorem, I have to do this, I have to approach it a different way. So when you learn the algebraic equation, when you learn a geometry equation, to solve it in a different theorem, right? Approach in a different angle, same thing happens with your life. When you grow as an adult, you will apply a different approach, different theorem for solving your problem. That is why maths is very important. So if a child is not good in maths, don't change that subject. Change the teacher. And if you agree to the teacher, change the parent also. Poonam has, uh, Dr. Poonam has put another uh, angle to that. If you put the child sleep uh, alone 
from early child may feel abundant. So educate the child. We love you. We will take care of you. Sleeping separately, anyways, when you sleep with us, that doesn't make you attached to me. There is a bond of love. Even if you stay in a different city, I will still love you. You are just staying in a different room. Absolutely okay. Right? That doesn't mean you are abundant. And now there are some children who have the separation anxiety. So why the separation anxiety? I tell you the results. So you threaten your child. When the child does not listen to you, you threaten your child, I will leave you. I will drop you to your neighbor's place. I will send you to boarding school if you don't listen to me. You threaten to the child for separation. Or maybe your husband-wife relation is not good. That's why the child is having high separation anxiety. Right? Maybe you can start uh, from a different uh, bed in the same room and then the different room. So, someone as early they start sleeping separate room, they grow independent, they grow more confident, they grow fearless. Okay. Now, what do you want? Questions? Any other scenario you want? You try everything as a downfall. Anything you do, any medicine you take, any therapy you do, there is always going to be downfall. Okay, anything you do, you act as a good parent, the child asks you something, you give it, there is a downfall for it. You, the, Your child asks something, you do not give, there is a downfall for it. So as a good parent, what you do is, you analyze benefit versus risk. Okay, if benefit is high, as compared to the risk of your action, you do that. <laughs> you do that, right? So everyone now write down, I will ask you a very difficult question. There is a minor depression, there is a major depression, and there is a bipolar disorder. These are three similar diseases, similar conditions. Right. How do you differentiate between them? Take 30 seconds to think, then write your answer in the one chat. Don't write one line, two line, three line, okay? Don't do that. Start typing your answer, and after 30 seconds, you will send this answer. If you are watching this recording, you can write in the comments. Bipolar disorder, minor depression, major depression. How will you differentiate between this three? Also remember, this major depression is not going to stay there. The client may have certain months of depression, maybe winter days or maybe summer days. Okay. Minor depression versus major depression and bipolar. Okay, so someone wrote bipolar disorder, there will be mood swings. Wrong. Wrong concept. Someone who has mood swing, that is not bipolar disorder. Correct, Suchitra. Very good. Very good, Suvira. Very good, Arya. Good, Suchitra. So, now, you write down everyone. Then we come to this answer. Oh. Vishali, you have read the book. Good. Good, Sangeeta. Tanya, good. Richa, good. Good answer. Good, Nipti. 
So mood swing is not bipolar disorder. Mood swing is irritability, hormonal changes, premenstrual syndrome, benarchy. <laughs> Okay. Now, first divide bipolar disorder versus depression. Bipolar disorder will clearly have a cycle. Two weeks depression followed by four days either hypomania or mania. Correct? Hyperactivity. This will continue. Two weeks depression, four days. Two weeks depression, four days. Minor depression, major depression, both can be seasonal. So that becomes difficult to differentiate with the bipolar disorder if it is seasonal, minor, major depression. Now, if you have minor and minor and major depression, any depression, so this will not have episodes of psychosis. Okay, number one. Number two, how do you differentiate between minor and major depression? Major depression, the diagnosis is complete loss of interest, apathy, withdrawal. Suicidal talks, thoughts, or attempts. So even if someone has a suicidal thought, that will be considered as a major depression. Okay. Minor depression person will have low mood, irritability, waking up early in the morning, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., right? And unable to fall asleep, overeating. Unable to focus on work. So that is a minor depression. Right? How many of you are facing presently the symptoms or last six months you had certain days where you were waking up early in the morning, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the middle of the night and you are not able to fall asleep. Write down your time. So if it is happening with you, you are undergoing minor depression. So major depression will come if you don't do something now. Okay. Middle of the night, waking up, unable to fall asleep, you start looking for your mobile. So if it happens with you, now what are the things? What are the things you need to do? So can you prevent minor depression to converting to major depression? So there are things you need to do. Number one thing, you will start light exercise. This light exercise can be talk, uh, talking, <laughs> replying in the chat, typing, or small walk, either at your home or outside, preferably in the garden. If you are treadmill, half kilometer, 100 meters, 10 meters, start something. Okay. Number two, involve yourself something in something. I tell you the reason for that. There has been a study which says that, very good lecture. There has been a study which says that when you get bored, you have a boredom that leads to depression. And when you are depressed, that leads to losing interest in something. And because you lose interest in something, that causes you boredom. Okay. So you keep involving yourself busy. You try to keep yourself busy. Either take up some new activity, take up some new course, take up some new learning, or take up some new task, responsibility. Or you keep yourself busy in your daily life. Why the laborers, they don't complain of depression? Right? Why your maid does not complain of depression? She doesn't call you and say, Madam, I don't think I am. Right? But if you are a manager, then you might call and say, Madam, my mood is low, right? Or you make some excuse, you are feeling under the weather. <coughs> so they don't have time. They are so busy. Their body is occupied. Number three is your diet change. So you eat Domino's, you eat Pizza Hut, you scientifically identify which one is causing you anxiety, which one is causing you depression. Right? Then you avoid that. So you find your what is your loyalty. Then you go to Pepsi, you go to Coke, you drink both of them and you find which one is causing your depression, which one is causing your anxiety. Then you drink, uh, then you eat sweets, 
in a week you eat more sweets in a week uh, in a week uh, you eat more salty food you identify which one is causing you depression right number 4 the best part is to avoid your depression is to help someone when you help someone it releases sudden gush of dopamine you feel rewarded that is a non transactional reward someone blesses you you feel that you are getting healed you feel good when you help someone so all of you as a psychology counselor you should heal someone you should help someone you should counsel someone right but don't do it for free because if you do it for free people will say your counseling is okay you need to learn more <laughs> okay they will judge you <clears throat> take up some unknown clients and if you are finding it difficult to take up clients you can take up my internship in my internship i give you 80 to 100 clients for next one year to practice on that's a very good thing and at the end you get the stipend also right take up my internship you will get to practice on 80 to 100 clients there will be some clients you will do mistakes no problem i will allocate another counselor to that client and another client to you there will be clients you will do good but despite that they will try no problem it is a part of your learning that even despite you are a good counselor there are counselors who will always cry that you are not a good it's okay you have to accept that you have to realize you are the best the client is bad so i will give you another client in that scenario if the client writes some bad review about you i will take care of that All right so in a year when you get 80 to 100 clients you become perfect psychology counselor you visit your psychology counselor in your city they are also not taking up this many clients okay you will love it and the best part is after the internship you get the stipend after the internship you can get attached with me as a freelance and you get paid for taking up the clients right presently there are 500 people attached with me they have completed their internship and now they are doing their freelance as per their convenient time and they are earning 20000 to 1 lakh per month some of them are homemaker plus freelance some of them are doing their job with freelance some of them are purely freelance yeah yeah internship is guided here yeah. so so many clients at once you don't get obviously in a year you get 80 to 100 clients it means in a month you get around 8 clients it means one or two clients in a week so i give you clients weekly during the internship you get the clients weekly dear yeah everything is there tracking training if the client cries if the client says hey bad counselor change the counselor that is your tracking if the client is coming back again next time paying more it means you are a good counselor no problem either way you continue to get the clients it's a part of the learning please ask some questions i think my how many of you who go for uh, outside food uh, more than once in a week more than once in a week outside food yeah swiggy is also counted as outside food <laughs> yeah only on weekends yeah still more than one food order at home counted yeah okay so you know what is your diagnosis but don't worry so that is your coping mechanism so if you if you feel depressed if you feel anxious and you know that there is something that helps you make good feel good you are doing that it's absolutely okay dear right nothing wrong in that don't say that oh my god you are depressed you are eating outside now i will stop eating outside don't do that you know so it's completely okay to eat outside it's completely okay to do something stupid 
it's completely okay uh, to do whatever you want. That makes you feel good. Okay, major versus minor depression. So Suvira wants to repeat. Minor depression, you wake up early in the morning, 3 a.m. <laughs> 20 people, those who are out, you wake up, uh, you know what is your diagnosis. So find out who is causing that. Okay, whether it is husband, whether it is you, whether it is your food, whether it is your in-laws, whether your siblings, parents, manager, job, something is causing you. Mind depression or food most likely. Padai, achha. Padai se to depression thik ho jata hai. So study relieves your depression because you get money when you study. <laughs> so money brings happiness. Money cures depression. So I can talk one hour on this topic. Oh my God. So you have pillow, Asha, right? Use the pillow. Snoring will be silent for the night. I mean, use the pillow on your ears. What? There are so dirty mind people here. They had a completely different imagination of using the pillow. I mean, use pillow on your ears and cover your ears. Oof. So bad people. I never imagined such a naughty and dirty mind people. You thought using pillow on. So use pillow. Huh. What was the age? I was talking. ADSD. Hey, what was it? I was talking. Can you write? Huh. Thank you, Suvira. Okay. So Asha has found another solution. She uses a pillow and then goes upstairs and sleeps there. Very good, Asha. I like you. Very good. Very bold. Very good. So minor depression, you wake up early, you eat more, uh, you are irritable. And you are less focused on your work. You want to start something, suddenly you take up your phone, you leave your space, you get distracted. You are behaving like ADSD. Okay, you are not, you are hyperactive, you are not able to focus on your work. That is minor depression. How many of you are unable to focus on your work? You have a task and as soon as you open your task, you start watching TV, you talk, start talking to someone or you remember something else or you start watching your mobile. You know what is your diagnosis, huh? minor depression. Okay. So there is a major depression. After the major depression, there is a hopeless. So if I have called you hopeless, you know what phase you have gone through. Very good. So you survived your major depression. So if you are hopeless, you should get a reward. That you went through minor depression, you survived your major depression. Now you are so hopeless that you don't care for anything in the world. Very good. Major depression you sleep more, you eat more or less, you are socially withdrawn, you don't bother, you are completely apathetic, you lose interest. Another major feature of major depression is self-care is lost. You do not comb your hair. <laughs> Anyone who has not combed your hair since three days, write down in the chat or blink your eyes. You don't want your diagnosis to be known to your husband now. So blink your eyes secretly. So if you're not combing your hair since three days, major depression. You do not bathe daily. 50% of the people are going to write the answers now. You give excuse that there is a winter. So this is major depression. You lose interest, or ignore self-care, socially withdrawn, eat more or less, sleeps more. If you are irritable, good. At least you are a minor depression patient. Yeah.
Very good, Kankana. Very good. Everyone goes to the phase, my dear. So you always remember, either you are anxious, stress, minor depression, major depression, bipolar. Everyone goes through that phase. You have to fight with your mind and come back, come back. You have to do certain things to come back. There is no one else going to pull you back, dear. Either you need to take help, go to a counselor, or you need to engage yourself in some work, or you need to start helping people. So in my life, what I have realized, when I help people, when I heal someone, I feel more uh, relaxed, calm, peaceful. I feel comfortable. I feel happier. So when you help someone, you feel your happiness. You find your happiness. When you help someone, feel happy. Very good. So you have to release dopamine. And for dopamine, you need serotonin. So where is serotonin secreted? Everyone write down the answer, then we end this class. I'm hungry now. Probably I will go outside. You know what is the diagnosis? Okay. Hey, this is Sojanya Lakshmi from Bangalore and Andhra Pradesh. She has written pancreas. Huh. Serotonin is secreted in the gut. It is secreted in the intestine. For serotonin, then serotonin is converted to dopamine, which relieves your depression. So, for serotonin should be high, you need to have good food, you need to have prebiotics and probiotics. There is a video on the channel about this. You can watch. 10 good things nutritionists and dietitian tell to their clients. Then there is one video on toilet water. How many of you have watched this video of toilet water? Can you tell me please? The concept of toilet water in nutrition. So there was a funny question in one class. To answer that, I have, done. have you watched this video? I am sending you the link right now. Then we end the class. No, if you watch, you can say yes. So this is a video. There is a concept of toilet water in nutrition and dietetics. You should watch this. Write in the comment. Okay, please comment in the video on the YouTube channel. Whatever videos you are watching, you can comment on the channel. Okay, if you like it, if you don't like it, if you agree, if you don't agree, whatever. Anything you can write. I will also reply. Should we end the class today? Watch this video and write your comments. No, you don't want to end the poll. There is another video on marriage counseling. Exam updates. Okay, Gunjan is very interested in exam. I'm a servant. Oh. So the video with my daughter, I will send. This is a video with my daughter, which we had. This video, when you watch, you will realize the dynamics of father-daughter dynamics and how the trust is built. And write in the comments, what are your learnings for each of this video. In the comment means, I mean YouTube comments. Like, like, subscribe, comment. I never say that, but you do that. Okay. So I'm very hungry, plus tired, plus throat infection. But I enjoyed communicating with you and interacting with all of you, okay? So for those who are interested to learn marriage counseling, come to us. In the marriage counseling program, it has just started last Wednesday. This you will learn relationship test, 20 relationship tests. There are tests for 
respect, trust, anger, stonewalling, criticism, compatibility, love. So you will be able to identify what is the problem between the couple. If couple says that he does not respect me, does not trust, no. Within that, which component is the problem? Right? So there are each test for each thing. You will love it. You can engage the client for 15 to 20 sessions. When you do this test, you are able to identify what is the problem within the couple. 50% problems you can solve by opening up their communication and remaining 50% you solve with couple activities. So you will learn 20 relationship tests and 100 couple activity in the marriage counseling program. Lawyers, marriage counselor of the court, they do this program from us for this syllabus. This is our copyright content, not available out outside. Talk to me, join from this Wednesday if you want, if you are interested for marriage. Do that. Because next batch of us, the fees is going to be double. Because August, we had the booking. Most of the lawyers, they did. Everyone, almost the August batch was lawyers. You WhatsApp me, I will help you for that. From Wednesday onwards, you start attending the marriage. Within two clients, you will recover the fees of the marriage counseling. Because with the relationship test and couple activity you learn, you can engage the client for 15 to 20 sessions. Even if you are charging 1000 rupees per client, you are you can easily earn 15,000 to 20,000. Within two, three clients, you will recover the money. If you want to take up the life clients, take up my internship. You will love it. The benefit with my internship is technically it is almost zero cost. Plus, you get the opportunity to start earning after the internship. Very clear. Because in freelance business, the most difficult part is where do you bring the client? With my internship, that problem is solved. Lifetime, I continue to give you the clients. Okay. So, gold band to show off. Yeah, that's what you like. Yeah. It's called dragon. So, there is a phoenix and there is a dragon on this to show off. I will. So when I go for, like in Medanta recently, we had this emotional wellness uh, training where we trained 700 nurses. Then one of the session was with managers, a small group, 20, 30 people, managers. And there, um, like some girls, they started laughing and they were discussing something. I said, yeah, ask me what is the question, even if you are, even a rich one, even if you have something, so say, so one girl asked, so itna bada kangan kyo ban apne? So I was like, no, it is not Kangan. It is a bracelet actually. Yeah. I'm not a girl to wear the Kangan. <laughs> so it happens. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. It was good. We have a conference at Medanta Hospital, 23rd, 24th, 25th for nurses. I will be there in Gurga. If you want exam dates, I'm going for this. So 23rd, 24th, 25th January, you can visit. Okay. I'm in WhatsApp and then meet me. Uh, second is uh, the exam dates around mid feb Next session, probably I will give you exam brief. All MCQ, easy exam, mid feb old batch. I don't. Yeah. So uh, mid feb five days tentative. We will get a confirmed date by Janet. I am from you. You will get the notification. Don't worry. Have a great time. It was great interacting with you. Very good audience. Very less hopeless people today. Good. Thank you. Everyone. Have a great time. Don't use pillow. Bye.